Welcome to this week's uh, Parsha discussion on Parshat Emor. It's been, I feel like it's been a while since we, we've we gotten together from all the, the yoms and traveling and things like that. Um, so I'm glad to be back together. And this week's Parsha has a lot of good things. So many that I, I made three source sheets. <laughs> this mm-hmm. is no one. <laughs> I finally settled on this. Um, we talk about the holidays and it talks about um, Leket and Peya, the sort of commandments to take care of the poor in our community. Um, and it also talks about Kohanim. I wasn't sure. Sometimes Avery joins us. I thought it would be interesting to have a, a real live Kohanim in the, the right. audience. Um, and I wanted to look at one particular uh, verse and sort of trace it a little bit through the Gemara and Halacha to see what it means sort of for us today. So let me share my screen here. And there we go. Um, so this is a large block of text. We don't have to read the whole thing, um, but what it is, is God um, telling Moshe to tell Aharon, interesting little chain there, um, that anyone who has any kind of defect, um, here on the third line, asher bo mum, lo yikrav lahakriv lechem, eloha, uh, lechem elohav, that anyone who has any kind of defect will not be qualified to offer the food of his God, so not to participate in temple service. So what does that mean to have a moom? Um, there are lots of different ways to do it, right? If you are an iver, if you're blind, if you're pisach, you're lame, uh, harum, if you are um, uh, a limb that is too short uh, or, or sarua that is too long, um, something that makes you look different. Um, although blind maybe is a little, you know, it's our lame is a little bit hard to know, but, um, something that, that is, uh, that is not the way that a normative person would look. Um, also, uh, an isha sheria bo shever regel, o shever yad, someone who has a broken leg or a broken arm. So that's a sort of interesting one. Um, it's a little bit unclear from the text if that means like ever, or a current broken arm or broken leg, right? Or uh, one that's set sort of funny. It's a little hard to know. Um, o gibain, o dak, o tivulul, be'eno. Uh, these are words I was glad uh, were translated for me on the other side. A hunchback, a dwarf, or someone who has a growth in his eye. Uh, right, these are all, you know, um, things that it's like a little bit unclear uh, why they would disqualify you. Maybe someone who is very short would have trouble reaching things in the Beit HaMikdash uh, or someone who has a hunchback, right? Some kind of physical uh, disformity that would make it hard for you to do the work. Um, but not all of these necessarily seem to be things that would make you not be able to do the work, right? Certainly uh, the last ones here, Garav, Oyalefet, Omaroach, Ashech, uh, a boil scar, scurvy, or crushed testes. It's like a little bit hard to know. Um, and that any one of our own children, offspring, right? Anyone who is sort of qualified to be a priest, if he has any of these things, because only men here, right? Um, then uh, he should not do the offerings. And not only that, but lo yavo el hamizbeach, ve el hamizbeach lo yagesh ki mumbo. Right, he shouldn't enter the curtain or come near the altar. Like he really should, he has no place in the Beit Hamikdash. Seems or the Mishkan seems to be what the text is saying here. And I think that this is a very hard text. Like I thought about, like, did I really want to bring such a hard text? Like it's a little bit uncomfortable, right? It's one of those things that the Torah uh, tells us that you you kind of want to be like, no, it's fine, right? Like today we can build ramps. We have shulchans that unfold and come down to uh, wheelchair height. You know, we could do anything. We don't need to, to disqualify people. Um, and shockingly, or maybe not so shockingly, the, the, the rabbis of the mission of the Gemara struggle with the same question um, as to like why this is. It seems like there must be another way around it. And the Torah doesn't give us any real reason. It just says no. So the Mishnah in Megillah um, talks about this idea, right? A priest who has blemishes on his hands, um, right? Which is, uh, we do talk, uh, I think 
we don't talk exactly about that above, but uh, some kind of blemish on his hands may not lift his hands to do the priestly benediction. So here, right, the Mishnah is already translating it into language that's more important for us, right? Because if there was a Kohen here with us, we might he might say, well, I can't go to the Beit HaMikdash anyway, big deal, right? Um, but the, the rabbis of the Mishnah are saying, wait a second, actually, the Kohanim play a very vital role in our communities. They they offer the Birkat Kohanim and uh, he will not be able to yisa et kapav, offer the, the priestly benediction if he has these blemishes on his hands. And now a reminder that in Safaria, the bold is the words in on the, the right hand side and the rest is sort of there to help us. So uh, with the help of Rashi and some other um, interpretations, we know that uh, why is it, right? Uh, because of his blemish, people will look at his hands and it is prohibited to look at the hands of the priests during the priestly benediction. So this is interesting, right? For the first time, we're seeing maybe a reason why God is saying not to do it. Hello, Nelson. Uh, we were just, uh, we were reading uh, a difficult passage about the Kohanim who are disqualified from service because of some sort of uh, disability or deformity. Um, and we were talking about why that might be. So the, the rabbis of the Mishnah assume that it somehow calls attention to them, or at least in our day and age, when, when the main role that a Kohen has is to offer the Birkat Kohanim, where you're not allowed to look at the hands, the rabbis are assuming that if you have some weird thing on your hands, that people will look. And Rabbi Yehuda says, um, Af mi istis ufua. Someone whose uh, hands were colored with satis, a blue dye, may not lift his hands. Right, so Rabbi Huda is spelling it out for us very explicitly. You don't want a Kohen who's going to draw attention to themselves with their physical deformity. So I think this is still super uncomfortable, but what's interesting about it and what we'll see uh, spelled out a little bit more over time is that it seems like the Mishnah is um, shifting the blame, so to speak, from the Kohen to the Am, right? It's not, you might have thought when just reading the plain shot of the text here that a Kohen who had a deformity was like disqualified by his deformity. But really, he's disqualified because we can't keep our eyes to ourselves, right? That seems to be the the understanding here. And in fact, the Gemara um, commenting on this Mishnah um, does talk about this a little bit and sort of tries to like tease it apart a little bit more. Um, so uh, here the Gemara says, Tana, right? It was taught in a Brita. So only the blemishes that are on your face, hands, and feet. So what, what do those have in common is that that's what we can see, right? If you had some kind of like weird mark on your shoulder, it wouldn't matter because if what we're worried about is the congregation looking, right, then they can't look. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi says, um, Yadav bahokaniot lo yisa et kapav. If his hands are spotted with white bl blotches, he cannot lift his hands. Tanya, nami hachi, right? The Gemara also says, oh, this is also taught in a Brita. Here, Yadav bahokaniot lo yisa et kapav, akumot akushot lo yisa et kapav. Also, if your hands are curved inward or bent sideways, he may not lift his hands to recite the priestly benediction. Um, and I, I want to say that, right, this is hard. It is hard, I think, to look away from things that look unusual. And so you could imagine that if someone did have some kind of weird thing with their hands, it would be hard to not look, right? That I could understand maybe the, the inclination, not to say that it's right, but at least it's understandable. Um, Amarav Asi. Rav Asi adds a, a story here. He says, that a priest from Haifa or Beit Sha'an may not lift his hands. 
Um, and here it seems to be because actually he's like pronouncing the words wrong, right? Rev Asi is saying the dialect of Haifa or Beit Shan um, is not guttural enough, right? In which case, none of us would probably really be qualified to be a Kohanim anymore because we all pronounce, right? We don't pronounce these um, letters in the same way. Um, Right, and then we sort of get distracted by this. That uh, in in that price that also says that even people, the people of Beit Shan or Haifa, or even the people of Tivonin, uh, shouldn't even be able to lead the service because they all pronounce these words wrong. So, you know. I just want to point out that like for Rav Asi, the physical deformity and some kind of like other thing that sounds funny or weird to his ear or might be improperly said is like all part of the same category. There's no stigma maybe for Rav Asi about a physical deformity versus something else. Then um, Rabbi uh, Yochanan adds a uh, idea. He says here, right, that someone who is blind um, in one eye, right? So in the text, it says, if you're blind, you can't do it. And he says, what about just one of his eyes? Oh, he shouldn't do it. And he says, right? But there was, the Gemara says, well, wait a second, Rabbi Yochanan, you just said that this isn't right. But wasn't there a certain priest who was blind in one eye in your neighborhood? To have a pares yade that actually did recite the Birkat Kohanim. And so they're saying, Rabbi Yochanan, what are you saying here, right? Rabbi Yochanan is trying to come out with this blanket statement. Any priest who is blind in one eye can't duchen. And the Gemara challenges him and says, wait a second, there is such a person in your community and he does duchen. And the Gemara answers, "Hahu dash biiro hava," right? And this is the thing that we're going to like latch onto is that the priest was a familiar figure in his town, and therefore he would not attract attention. And I think that that is fascinating, right? That we say, "Oh, if like you know him, you don't even recognize his deformities," right? It's actually, I think, a very deep and powerful thing to say mm -hmm. about how we. Um, you know, what is normal, right? When when something is different, I, I traveled to India uh, in college and I was the only white person that some of these children had ever seen. And people constantly came up to me and like pushed their finger against my arm <laughs> to see if like my skin would change color, right? Because it was so unusual to them. And once I left, they were like, oh, that white person, that's like weird that she's white and not brown, right? But it wasn't um such a, Havaya anymore, right? It wasn't such an experience to see me anymore. And so Rabbi Yochanan maybe forgets about the Kohen in his community who's blind in one eye because he's so accustomed to him. Or maybe they're saying, listen, no one's paying any attention to him. He's just that Kohen who is blind in one eye. Right. And so I think what the Gemara is trying to do is say, what does it mean to look at the, the Kohen? Is it anyone with a deformity will be looked at automatically? Or is there like a little bit more nuance there? And I think that they can, what they're doing is they're continuing to shift the blame from the Kohen to the community, right? The Kohen can't do anything about his one-eyed blindness or his spotty hands, um, but the community can stop looking. The community can say, this is not a big deal. Let's move on, right? Let's just do it. Um, and so similarly, Rabbi Yehuda says, right, someone who has yadav tzvuot, hands that are colored, should not lift his hands to recite the, the, the duchening. Um, but they say, oh, well, if most people in the town, they do this, then everyone's hands are blue, then no one cares. Right. And so I think it's just it's just such a fascinating um, statement about like what is normal and what is not normal. And so I think it's very uh, ahead of their time, the rabbis of the, the Mishnah and the Gemara. And in fact, the Shulchan Arach goes through sort of all the different things um, that um, that might sort of stop you from duchening, and then follows the rule of Rabbi Yehuda that if if everyone sort of knows him in the city and won't the dahinu shehim regilimbo the makirin hakol sheyeshbo otomum isakapav right as long as they recognize that he has this deformity and they don't care and they're not going to look anymore. 
um, then they're fine. And they even go, the Shulchan Aruch of Cairo even goes so far as to say, what does it mean? Like, how long does it take for someone to become accustomed to you? It takes 30 days, right? So anyone who has been in his town for 30 days can then go duchen because everyone's used to him. When you go to a new place, then you might not be able to duchen because you would sort of cause a commotion in that place. Um, and that, um, Right, there is sort of like a discussion. Does he have to live there all the time? Could he be one of these people who sort of wanders from town to town, right? Like school teachers or or um, scribes. These are people who don't stay all the time, but they sort of make their circuit through a, a set of towns, and so they might still have become accustomed over these thirty days. And then, right, the the Shulchan Aruch adds a, another thing. Machaber says, "Well, listen, nowadays." We know that the Kohanim wrap their palaces around themselves. And in that case, you can't see them. So then actually the whole thing is fine, right? As long as you can't see the problem, it's like it's not there, which means, right, it's not, it's not that it's displeasing to God for a person to have some kind of moom defect. It's that it's just too distracting to the people. And so if you can either get them accustomed or you can cover it up, then you can leave it the way it is. So what about the minhag that you're not supposed to look at the Kohanim when they're doing the priestly blessing, that something yeah. will happen to you? Yes, I actually, Nebuch, to my dear friend Jen, who when she was a child was so certain that the reason she had to get glasses was that she peaked once. Mm -hmm. And she had like this amazing amount of guilt for years until she like mentioned it offhand to her mother. Well, I feel so bad I had to get glasses because I looked at the Kohanim and her mother said like, sweetheart. <laughs> You've got glasses because you have like a stigma in one eye, whatever it is, right? <laughs> um, well, because your mother has glasses. Yeah, mother, but that's, why, that's why you have glasses. Yes. No, I think so. So and I think that that's one of, I think that that custom is very, very old. Uh -huh. that, um, one, the reason that we say it is we say that God's presence is somehow dwelling in, in the Kohen's hands or above their, their heads or sort of that the Kohanim are channeling God's divine presence. And so that's why we don't look. Wow. And I think that that is part of what is worrying the rabbis is, and it were, or maybe it's, it's the reason that they can latch on to for why God would say that priests with uh, some kind of deformity can't dachan is because it's so serious not to look. But sometimes like, you know, when something is so different or weird, or like you're passing a car accident on the highway and like, you can't help but looking. And so the rabbis are saying, if, if a, a Kohen who has some kind of thing where everyone just can't help but look, They'll look during duchening and they'll lose their eyesight or whatever other, you know, right. we, we know, um, right. But something bad will happen because of that. So I think that's exactly, that's the custom that is um, giving them an understanding of why we have the spirit all. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. I mean, like on the other hand, Anna, you're right, right? Like if we're not supposed to look, then it really shouldn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, I read in one of those like pop, you know, psychology books, like uh, the tipping point or, you know, one of those that um, orchestras used to be very heavily male. And when they started doing blind auditions, all of a sudden women were filling up the orchestra benches because they were just as talented as the men, but there was a heavy gender bias in, in the musical industry. Mm -hmm. um, so right. You, you would think it was sort of the same thing They're in essence, they're behind a, a curtain. So it shouldn't matter what they look like at all, as long as they're Kohanim. And it seems to me like the rabbis don't even consider here that God will not use them as a conduit for God's blessing, right? That That's what I think would be really troubling on some level, is if we interpreted those psukim as to say people who have some kind of physical deformity are like broken people, right? But, but the rabbis don't even go there. They say, who are the broken people, in my opinion, right? The broken people are the ones who can't stop looking at someone who looks different than them. Mm. And I think that that's a really interesting, maybe. I, I mean, uh, one thing I take from it, it sounds like, oh, if you're not perfect, God doesn't want you. And, and that's not a good feeling. Um, yeah. not, I, don't, I don't like that. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I totally agree. I think that that is why when we look at those psukim, and again, because in those psukim, there is not 
a reason given, right? And so you right. could, your interpretation is, I think, logical and troubling, both, right? All it says are these people can't work in the Beit HaMikdash. And so I think the rabbis share the same concern that you do, Anna, which is to say, why can't they work in the Beit HaMikdash? Would God forbid we be saying that God views them as not fit uh, to do temple work, right? And in fact, the you are you're anticipating the next source. Um, the Rambam here in the um, the guide to the perplexed, the Mara Nebuchim. Sorry, I got far away. Um, right, he's, he he mentions right those who serve in the temple are uh, have That's served received great honor. Right. And so the Kohanim were distinguished from the rest. Right. And that's like what we know on one hand. And on the other hand, a priest with a blemish was not allowed to serve. Not only those who had a blemish were excluded, but also, according to the Talmud, those with an abnormal appearance. And so the Rambam is holding that tension with you. Right. Like, what does it mean to say the people in the, the temple are, have received great honor, but you cannot receive that honor if you have any kind of abnormal appearance? And so what does he say? For the multitude does not estimate a person by his true form, but by the perfection of his bodily limbs and the beauty of his clothes, right? Not God, the multitude, right? That we as humans can't seem to look past differences and deformities and abnormalities. And the temple was to be held in great reverence. So what is Maimonides saying? He's saying that God was worried that not that not that God thought that the Kohanim weren't fit, but that if we thought those Kohanim weren't fit, that the 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 reverence of the Beit Hamikdash would go down if we saw people serving there that we felt weren't fit as humans. Mm. Now it's I it's still troubling, right? Because why is this a place where God is not saying no? Everyone is holy. Everyone deserves right. Any Kohen deserves to serve in the Beit Hamikdash, and you people, multitudes, you have to get over it. Mm -hmm. And instead, it seems like maybe God is is catering to that in some way. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is that is difficult, for sure. Mm -hmm. And what about the fact that the Kohanim cover their heads and cover cover their faces with their talus or the talisim? So you right. don't, don't see anything anyway, and then you're not supposed to look at them because something bad will happen to you. <laughs> so uh right. So that's so so Rav Yosef Cairo in the Shulchan Aruch, right? He mentions that. He says, um, or, or actually I think it's the Ramah, sorry, who says. Uh, no, it's the Shulchan Aruch, right? That if the custom of the place, in Hag HaMakom, is that the Kohen wraps himself in the talit around his face, mm -hmm. then even if he does have deformities on his face or his hands, places where we might see them, he may still duchen, he may still yisai kapav, give the, the birkat kohanim. Because for, for the, the Shulchan Aruch following the Gemara understands that this is an us problem, not a them problem. Mm -hmm. Right. So they are still fit to Duchin as long as they won't distract people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're right. Everyone should look away for two reasons. Right. They should look away because you're not supposed to look at the Kohanim when you do the Birkat Kohanim. And they should look away because it's it's not, you know, it's not your business what someone's face or hands look like. But everyone is concerned about our human weakness. And it does seem to override on some level the the dignity of the Kohanim, which is troubling. I, I share in your your trouble. Mm -hmm. um, I heard this beautiful um, shewer from Julia Watts Belser, who is a, a great scholar. Um, she sits in a wheelchair. She came to Maharat, to the yeshiva when I was there, and she spoke about Kohanim and disabilities. Um, and this is an excerpt from an interview she did, um, because I, I didn't want to use my own words, which, you know, which I wrote down three years ago, scrawled in a notebook while I listened to her. Um, but I think that she addresses your problem, Anna. So I, I want to hear what you have to say about, uh, about her thought here. She, right? she says, when people first encounter these verses, they often assume that priests with disabilities were not allowed to be priests. That, that isn't true. A priest with one of the listed disabilities does not lose his status as a priest. 
right? That's an interesting thing. He still has access to his priestly portion, right? When you bring a, a korban, sometimes those korbanot go to the kohen. And what she's saying is that these kohanim who have disabilities still get that food. So they, they don't become non-kohens. They just become not working kohanim, right? They can't sacrifice on the altar. But there's still a significant act of exclusion here, and I don't think it's helpful to gloss over that, right? That's why I decided to go with door number three when I was considering is I think that that's okay. It's okay for there to be uncomfortable texts that we encounter. When I encounter this text, says Julia, I read it as a reminder of the long legacy of stigma and exclusion that has shaped the lives of so many with disabilities, myself included. I read it as a reflection of that reality a reminder to not flinch from recognizing the corrosive effect that stigma and social violence has in disabled people's lives, right? I think that that's, that's real and it's heavy and it's hard to read that text and say like, what does this say about Kohanim and our tradition and, and exclusion? That said, right, back in the text, in this case, I do think there is a liberatory message to be found in the way Jewish tradition has grappled with these verses. In my own scholarly work, I've shown how rabbinic texts interpret those verses to radically limit their scope, right? So we've looked at some of her examples um, from the Gemara and Megillah with the rabbis who talk about, right, if it's not in a place where you would see it, or if it's sort of uh, normal because everyone has blue dyed hands from being a dyer, or if they've, they've become accustomed to the person. The rabbi emphasize that a, a Jew with a disability can bless the congregation or lead them in prayer as long as they are known and familiar to the congregation. I find that to be a really powerful message and a hopeful one. To me, it suggests that congregations have a religious responsibility to break down barriers and challenge stigma so that people with disabilities become full and familiar members of our communities and so that our particular religious and ethical insights can become part of the fabric of our communities. Right. So I think what she's saying is beautiful, right? She's saying we can read this as like it's up to the Kohen to be there for 30 days or to cover up his disability. Or we can say we need to look hard enough in 30 days and say this does not matter. You're sitting in a wheelchair or having some kind of skin lesion or disease or being blind does not affect your ability to give us a bracha. And it's, it's on us, it's incumbent upon us to break down that stigma. Um, I wanna read a, a sort of edgier piece here um, that I, I learned from um, Julia Belser, uh, uh, who talks about um, this sort of the, the, the negative side of this, right? Um, she, uh, Harriet McBride Johnson, uh, she says, it's not that I'm ugly, it's more that people don't know how to look at me. The power wheelchair is enough to inspire gawking, but that's the least of it. Much more impressive is the impact on my body of more than four decades of a muscle-wasting disease. Now in my mid-40s, I'm carrying carpenter thin, flesh mostly vanished, a jumble of bones in a floppy bag of skin. I tried to brace for a while, but fortunately a skittish an uh, anesthesiologist said no to fusion plates and pins, all the apparatus that might have kept me straight. At age 15, I threw away the back brace and let my spine reshape itself into a deep, twisty S-curve. Since my backbone found its own natural shape, I've been entirely comfortable in my skin. A few times in my life, I recall particularly one largely crisp, largely lesbian cookout in Colorado, I've been looked at as a rare kind of beauty. But most often, the reactions are decidedly negative. I used to try to explain that I, in fact, enjoy my life, that it's a great sensual pleasure to zoom by power chair on those delicious muggy streets, but it gets tedious. God didn't put me on the street to provide disability awareness training to everyone who happens by. Right, and I think that that last line there is, uh, I think that when, when she teaches this text, right, she's saying, what does it mean for the Kohen to be up there and we have to, to look away? We have to have some kind of disability awareness training, right? God didn't put me on the street to provide disability awareness training to everyone who happens by. That somehow it's incumbent upon us to be accustomed to say everyone looks different, right? I, I notice it with my kids a lot. There is a uh, very short person. I don't even, I don't know the polite term. <laughs> uh, a person who uh, is very small, who works in our Trader Joe's 
And my four-year-old without fail says, oh, let me go ask that boy where this is. And I say, oh, sweetheart, he's a man, right? He's much shorter than, than I am, but he's still, he's the grown man. You should call him sir or mister, right? Just because he looks a little bit different. Um, and I see how hard it is for her to integrate that in her in her four-year-old's head, because it's like every time it's a novelty to her. Um, and so I don't know exactly the answers, and Julia Watts Belser has many better answers um, as to how to how does how do those 30 days transpire so that all of a sudden you're accustomed to how someone looks different than yourself? Um, but the idea that the the text in our parsha in Emor is a challenge, not something that we should just accept. That people who look different can't serve in the Beit HaMikdash or Dukhan from the Amud unless we can somehow look past uh, something that we might view as bad, but is actually fine, right? As Harriet McBride Johnson says, she likes the way she is. She's she's comfortable in her skin. And that we should then be comfortable holding that position in reverence, even when it doesn't look the way we think someone lofty should look. Um, and I, I, I think that... Um, I hope that we can all follow in the footsteps of our very early rabbis, even in the Mishnah, right? Not even just in the Gemara, but in the Mishnah and the Gemara, who are, are looking to find ways to help shift the balance so that it's up to us to include them, not exclude them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that helped you, Anna. Tell me. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, yeah, that's... Uh... It's okay. <laughs> it could be not okay too. Yeah, no, I know. But I, I think it's uh, Judaism to me is is like open to anyone, you know, that it's, it's an accepting religion in many, many ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that the way it's, it's said in this part, is, you know, like if you have a disability or you're, you know, you're not perfect, they don't want you. That's, it doesn't sound like Judaism to me. Yeah. But, you know, it just doesn't. But can I, can I say something? Please. Please do. Um, I, it was occurring to me that, uh, that there is a, a psychological phenomenon. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called unattention blindness. Like you, mm -hmm. if you're not paying attention to something, you're distracted you may not see something that's coming to you. Like a mm. person that's crossing the street, a car that's driving you may get, is one of the causes of accidents. Mm -hmm. And uh, fa familiarity uh, will diminish distraction. You stop thinking or seeing the, the, the deformed uh, priest because you are now familiar. You're not thinking about it anymore. It reminds me of the same thing that may, you don't know if I want to bring this, but call Isha, the voice of the woman, may be distracted mm -hmm. to some people. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think mean, the distraction uh, is uh, gives blindness. And the blindness means you're not seeing something. In this case, you're not seeing the deformity. So that's OK. Go ahead and pray, accept the blessing, the the, the Hmm. But am I, maybe I'm misunderstanding. But could we say that maybe when someone does look different, right, or the voice of a woman, which sounds so different, right, is that you, what you miss is the, the holiness, right, that's that, right, um, yeah. right, and so that's, that's like sort of human nature, and, and I think that it's okay for us to acknowledge those, those weak spots or blind spots, if you will, right, yeah. in our, in ourselves, so that we can be more attuned and better aware of how to overcome them, right, and so I think that um, if we just said, well, anyone and everyone is holy and pretended that it wasn't really hard to not look at someone with a deformity, then we would, uh, we might, we might just look and, and miss the bracha altogether. And by owning it, by saying, look, this is hard. We're going to have to work to overcome it. We hopefully can get better. Um, I think is maybe sort of the idea behind that Gemara. I think Kolisha is a, an interesting example, right? Um, because it, it reminds me of the phrase of a uh, victim blaming, right? Or victim shaming, right? When, when um, you know, God forbid someone is uh, treated unkindly, right? And they go to court 
uh, and we say, well, she was wearing a short skirt. She was out really late at night, right? Um, it does sound a little bit like we're doing the same thing with the Kohanim. Well, he looked kind of funny. Of course I was going to look at him, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think, right, we know that that's wrong, but we sometimes have to, to name it to overcome it, to work hard at overcoming it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's human nature to, uh, when, when something looks odd on a person, it's human nature to stare at them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's just, it's how we're met, we are, you know. I'm not saying that's good or bad. It's it's not good, but that's what it is, right? Yeah. And so training ourselves to become accustomed is perhaps one way to overcome that and to be able to give that the right of the Kohen back to him to say, you can go up and duchen, you know, right. we don't mind. We're not looking. You know, I was thinking like, for example, uh, if there's a person who is a Kohen, but he has a deformity and he is not allowed to duchen ever, isn't that distracting to him always mm -hmm. and painful? Yeah, it's a beautiful point about, you know, it seems like the, the text and our tradition and the rabbis prioritizing the, the multitudes over the individual, right? Oh, right, right. Yeah, but I think it's a it's a really fair and, and sort of a discomforting point to say, these Kohanim who already have a harder lot in life seem to be given an even harder uh, thing to overcome when maybe we should just say, go up, duchen, right? Like, mm -hmm. we'll get over it. We'll work harder. But instead we say, well, first we have to get over it, right? It also means that that person cannot sit quietly in the back. They have to sort of be out and about in public so that people become accustomed to them. There mm -hmm. is sort of an onus on the, the person as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's troubling for sure. But the rabbis also gave a workaround. You've got the strict rule and the rabbis come up with a workaround. Yeah. Now, you know, if everybody's hands are glued, then his hands could be glued. If he's been there for a while and everybody knows him, then it's not a problem. Um, if he only has one eye, if people are aware of that, then, you know, what's the problem? And um, the Hama Goldman Barish on the Pardes uh, mm -hmm. Parsha podcast this week uh, talks about this. She said, with all these restrictions, you know, what the handicap can't do, does that mean we should not have handicap accessible entrances in our synagogue? Mm. Does that mean we should not accommodate disabled people because they really, you know, don't count, they can't perform, they can't do this, they can't do that. They're not full people. Does that mean we ignore them? No, does not mean that at all. You do the workaround and, and you incorporate everybody. Mm. And people who are disabled, um, don't feel that they necessarily look disabled. They look, it's, this is their normal. Hmm. And, and this is their normal. And um, this is how they are. And this is, um, this is their life. And thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Nahama is such a brilliant teacher. I feel uh, lucky that I happened upon the same topic as her. Although I'm sorry if it was a little repetitive for you, Bobby. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that's a great example, right? It doesn't extend just to Kohanim, but to everybody. Um, and, and I think that, um, Spooky Valley does a beautiful job of making the sanctuary accessible. I mean, there, is, there is that ridiculous. But, well, there is the issue where yeah. I've had disabled friends, um, uh, Shirley Devoren, whose kids belong, I wanted to go to Shul two weeks ago and there was nobody to work the um, elevator. The elevator. So she could not come. Mm -hmm. She could not Are you come. talking about at Skokie Valley? No one yes. Oh, wow. And then I had, a, I had a friend, Deanne Bassett, and she's in a scooter. So she got up to the sanctuary. And then there was no way, with no one we could find to work the elevator to get her out. So we're walking around trying to find somebody to work the elevator. She's in the scooter. Uh, she oh. needs the elevator. We couldn't find anybody to get her out. So that, that presents a problem. I mean, Shirley wants to come to shore. Her grandkids are there. Her kids are there. There's nobody to run the elevator. Yeah. So that, yeah. That's a problem. 
it's a real problem because, you know, as beautiful and thoughtful as the sanctuary is, you're right. If you can't get there, good lot, it does for you. Um, yeah. And yet, you know, a Shabbat elevator is an enormous expense, although one certainly worth saving up for. But I'll look into that because I thought there was supposed to be the, someone there every Shabbat to, to work the elevator. But not at the elevator. They don't uh, stand there. They're right, not it's, waiting it's one of the janitorial staff, Mark or as well. Though, so you've got to find them or have yeah. somebody be able to alert them. And if you're outside yeah. um, or, and we were on, we were, on the sanctuary floor, we couldn't find anybody mm -hmm. who could find somebody to work the elevator. It, it, be, it becomes unpleasant. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's a great point that it doesn't matter how accommodating our emotions are if we don't put those things in place, right? We can say, everyone's welcome. You don't look different to us. But if there's no elevator, it doesn't really matter how nice we are. Um, there is the elevator, but no one to work it. Right. If there's no if there's no person to work the elevator, then it it takes away from our accommodating, maybe like emotional nature. Um, I think yeah. there is a person just to be aware. Mark must be aware of the the the, the issue so that he can be yeah. in tune with it. So I will definitely. But no, but how is he going to know exactly when Shirley's going to come and want the elevator? That's the issue. You, and, and and then you really can't have somebody there all the time. So some kind of device, some kind of modus. Yeah. To alert well, the right, there, there is a a non Jewish security guard at the door and so it seems to me he should be able to radio mark or, or something you know at the front door all the way down at the bottom mm -hmm. that, if that, right. if that could be put into place and that becomes part of his job description that would be great and that, i will look into it i can't yeah. i certainly can't make promises they have walkie talkies right they right. do yeah yeah so they could walkie talkie mark or or the other right. guy yeah, that would work that would work yeah. let them know the security guard knows um, and alert somebody and then surely you can get there. I will do that. I will look Good. into it. Excellent. Oh, I'm glad that not only did we learn Torah, but we might have made a Shabbat a better place. <laughs> for, for, for everyone. You solved for the problem. Everyone. Yeah. yeah. Very we, were the, we were the elevator committee today. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Great points all around. Um, and I think it's okay to also say, and this text is uncomfortable, right? We're glad that the rabbis had this sort of brilliant turnaround to the text, but it's a difficult text to look at. It's difficult to look at that Rambam and, and I think he meant it in a very nice way. Oh, look, like the, God was being so thoughtful about the multitudes holding the Beit HaMikdash in reverence and we're saying, no, wait a second, Rambam, you missed the point, you know, entirely, which is, you know, not something we want to say to the Rambam. Um, <laughs> But I think that it it is hard. So so I I appreciate everyone grappling with the text with me, and I will look into that. And I hope everyone has a an accessible and inclusive Shabbat. <laughs> I will actually. I will actually. Be Thank there. you. You'll be there this Shabbat. I'll actually be there this week. Oh, wonderful! Um, yes, yeah, seventy I'll degrees. Know. I'll be. Yes, it might finally be spring walk. for a brief time. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I saw David at uh, Yom Hatzma. It was nice to see him. But yeah, you're not going to be there this Shabbos, right? No. Oh, 